Hey everyone, welcome back to another Hardware News Recap for the week. In this one, we're talking about some rumors about Intel Alder Lake S and Alder Lake P and a potential change in the socket from LGA 1200 to LGA 1700. We'll be talking about Microsoft's GPU scheduling uh, details as Microsoft has published in its developer blog. Intel being told to halt shipments of CPUs to a certain server uh, manufacturer as enforced by the US government. GTX 1650 Ultra rumors, a data cap discussion, and ceramic. Before that, this video is brought to you by the Be Quiet PureBase 500DX. The PureBase 500DX is a new push from Be Quiet into mesh fronted cases that are more thermally focused. The 500DX maintains high build quality and attention to detail for its dust filters, front panel installation, and fan placement, and still has additional focus on noise control. The case comes with three 140mm Pure Wayne's 2 fans stock and has RGB LEDs, but with a physical hardware switch for easy control. Learn more about the Be Quiet Pure Base 500DX at the link in the description below. So first up, quick GN news item again. The X570 chipset Metro poster is upside down. The X570 chipset Metro poster is back in stock on store.gamersnexus.net. We sold through it really fast for the first print run. Uh, like I said last time, it's a, an accurate diagram representing the I.O of X570 and its associated CPUs. And so it's kind of an educational but fun look where we're taking the concept of a metro, a subway, or an underground map, and then extrapolating it out into what would that look like as applied to a computer. And the single coolest tweet I've received so far from someone who's received the poster when they bought it from us during the first run was a, an individual who had uh, put this poster up in his setup for model trains, which was actually super cool. I really liked seeing that. So uh, definitely props to you for going with the train computer hardware map to go with your actual train hobby. It's really cool to see that stuff. Anyway, it's back in stock on store.gamersnexus.net. If you want an educational but interesting and, and uh, taking some artistic liberties layout of the X570 chipset diagram and its IO capabilities, that is on the store. This is probably the last print run we're doing. Um, but we'll see how it, how it goes over the next couple days or so. Uh, so you can pick that one up. All right, first one is Microsoft detailing GPU scheduling in more depth than previously. We've mentioned hardware scheduled uh, or hardware accelerated GPU scheduling in a couple of news episodes now, but now finally it's out of, a, out of the realm of speculation and into the realm of getting some more information behind it. At this point also I'll note when I'm recording this news video, it is before we've recorded our video on hardware accelerated scheduling. And that's something we're working on. Patrick has all the data. He's working on writing the script today while I'm filming this. So we'll have an episode on that and the performance impact either just before or just after this news video. But anyway, Microsoft has provided some more information. This is the stuff that surfaced after the May 2020 update for Windows 10. And previously, most of the coverage online has highlighted that people expect the feature uh, to reduce latency or somehow improve performance by a reduction of overhead, especially because the GPU is able to uh, task itself. It's able to manage its own VRAM rather than burning cycles elsewhere to do that. And so you're removing an abstraction layer uh, to get the VRAM managed by the GPU instead. So this turns into more of a question now of whether buffering was used previously. This is something we'll talk about in our GPU scheduling piece, but the idea that people have kind of run away with online is that there's a latency reduction, but we'll talk about that more in the other piece. So now in a blog post penned by Steve Pronovost of Microsoft, GPU scheduling has been fleshed out a little bit more. GPU scheduling has been around since Microsoft first rolled out Windows Display Driver Model 1.0. However, Pronovost notes that while GPU scheduling has changed quite a bit over the years, at least one aspect hasn't. Quote, over time, we have significantly enhanced the GPU scheduler at the heart of WDDM, supporting additional features and scenarios with each new WDDM version. However, throughout its evolution, one aspect of the scheduler was unchanged. We have always had a high priority thread running on the CPU that coordinates, prioritizes, and schedules the work submitted by various applications, end quote. So that high priority thread essentially means a certain amount of intrinsic overhead as there's a certain amount of buffering that has to take place between the CPU and the GPU. Moreover, a user's input is picked up in one frame, but it isn't rendered by the GPU until the following frame. Pronovost notes that this type of overhead is often masked by how applications are written, but it looks like hardware-accelerated GPU scheduling is laying the groundwork to change that altogether. 
With hardware accelerated GPU scheduling, Windows will be able to offload most GPU scheduling tasks to a dedicated, quote, GPU based scheduling processor, as named by Microsoft in the post. That's assuming the right hardware, or a graphics card, and support at the driver level. As of now, both AMD and NVIDIA have rolled out drivers that you can download from their sites for hardware accelerated GPU scheduling. However, AMD is currently limiting support to the RX 5600 and 5700 series, both desktop and mobile, as the drivers are in beta. NVIDIA's support is a little bit more broad, but not much, encompassing all RTX cards. Pronovos goes on to say that, quote, Windows continues to control prioritization and decide which applications have priority among contexts. We offload high frequency tasks to the GPU scheduling processor, handling quantum management, and context switching of various GPU engines. Although both AMD and NVIDIA have drivers out there now that support this, neither of them has yet made a big deal out of it because, again, it's uh, just the beginning, and this is something that the Microsoft Dev blog post hints at as well. The developer blog says, that the new scheduler, this is a quote from them, the new GPU scheduler is a significant and fundamental change in the driver model, and changing the scheduler is akin to rebuilding the foundation of a house while still living in it. Quote, the goal of the first phase of hardware accelerated GPU scheduling is to modernize a fundamental pillar of the graphics subsystem and to set the stage for things to come. But that's going to be a story for another time. So for now then, users shouldn't really expect any significant or groundbreaking change for performance uh, due to the hardware accelerated GPU scheduling. It'll take some time and development resources for Windows and GPUs to fully leverage this feature. And it's obviously something we'll be covering a bit more uh, as we move forward with it. Next up, this week news broke from the Pentagon of a list of companies accused of having ties to the People's Liberation Army, or China's military. Among those companies is Inspur, who is the third largest server manufacturer globally and the single largest in China. The list, of course, also includes Huawei. As a result of this news, Intel had been temporarily forced to halt all shipments to Inspur as the U.S. government is looking to cut off access to American IP and technology. Tom's Hardware reached out to Intel for a comment and received the following statement in return. Quote, we have temporarily paused shipments to one customer in order to ensure compliance with the U.S. government export regulations. This is a temporary pause expected to last fewer than two weeks for some items and others will resume in a matter of days. We will resume shipments as soon as we can while ensuring compliance with U.S. law, Intel said to Tom's Hardware. We've included their story in our show notes document if you'd like to read more on that report. It isn't presently clear which products Intel had to halt the sales of, nor how much of a financial impact that might have had on the bottom line, but none of it really matters. Within days, Intel started shipments again, and Tom's followed up with Intel and received confirmation that the two companies began doing business together once again with the product lines that were previously halted. Next up, Intel documents showing uh, Alder Lake S, Alder Lake P, and LGA 1700 socket details, serial leaker and hardware sleuth Momomo underscore US, whom we'd like to point out is typically extremely accurate in the leaks that they post online. Uh, Momomo US has unearthed some technical documents that seemingly point towards details for Intel's upcoming Alder Lake platform. Intel is expectedly moving away from the LGA 1200 socket going forward, and this isn't altogether a uh, surprise. We've already more or less confirmed that Intel plans for the existing LGA 1200 socket and uh, pinout to be designated for its Rocket Lake S CPUs, which aren't out yet, and the already out Comet Lake S CPUs. So the documents specifically mention Alder Lake S and Alder Lake P. We know Alder Lake S is destined for desktop. That's S designations are typically the ones that uh, would be used in DIY PCs, for example. We know less about what form Alder Lake P is supposed to take, but per Intel socket naming scheme, LGA 1700 would be 1700 pins. That puts it at obviously doing some extremely uh, complex and high level math you can only get at GN. That would be 500 more pins than 1200. Don't ask how we figured that out. It'd take a long time to explain the equation. So Intel increased the pinout for Comet Lake already. We know most of that is intended for future IO expansion. Uh, this is more or less guaranteed at this point that this was what Intel was trying to do. Whether or not it materializes is a different story, but the plan, at least when Comet Lake launched, was that Intel would eventually be including PCIe Gen 4 support for at least the top GPU slot via Rocket Lake S once that comes out. And actually, you can see some motherboard manufacturers took a, a huge leap of faith and really put a lot of faith into Intel and have advertised future PCIe Gen 4 support for future processors. ASRock is a good example of this. Now, in speaking with other more motherboard manufacturers, we've learned that Intel doesn't even know if it's going to do Gen 4 yet in Rocket Lake S. 
even though that's the plan, it's not guaranteed. So those companies like ASRock are really kind of putting themselves on the line. That said, uh, we would certainly expect this more from ASRock than anyone else in the motherboard manufacturing space. Anyway, that was the plan. This is likely going to be uh, even more so the case for the Alder Lake platform. A lot of those pins will probably designated for uh, before IO expansion in the future. There's currently also an unsubstantiated theory online that's kind of fun, but uh, not supported that Alder Lake will take a similar approach to the hybrid Lakefield processors. So this is akin to ARM's big little design. The theory posits that Alder Lake uh, would come with a 16 core hybrid design, meaning that there'd be a mix of eight big cores and then eight little cores. So Lakefield uses a sunny cove or a large piece of silicon and then a Tremont or a small piece of silicon. Take that with a huge grain of salt, obviously, but that's one of the speculation or theories that we've seen out there. In another find by Momomo US, it seems we're destined to get yet another rewarmed GTX 1650 this time in the form of the GTX 1650 Ultra. This particular SKU is one from Galax, but we're likely to see more from other AIB partners soon enough if it holds true. This kind of follows what we saw with the 2060 KO, where EVGA was the first that we were able to publicly identify as using a 2080 silicon down to 2060 level, except that had things fused off. This is common when NVIDIA especially, but any manufacturer, but really NVIDIA, when they want to get rid of silicon, start prepping for the next generation, or just they realize that demand is higher for one than the other, they can't meet the lower end, and they end up with overstock. Typically what they'll do is fuse off features, so they physically limit access to them, and then bin it down as a lower end part so that they can recoup that cash that was invested in the silicon to begin with. So with the 2060KO, we essentially caught NVIDIA in a bit of an accident where they weren't doing anything evil, but rather they accidentally provided a better part than they were intending to. So uh, NVIDIA forgot to fuse a few of the features off for the 2080 brought down to 2060KO, and uh, KO is not the only one. There's other cards out there too, but they're less guaranteed than the KO is. So they brought it down and uh, in the process forgot to turn off some things that benefit its performance in, say, Blender or uh, professional applications as tested with spec view perf. So that was the story there. Now, this is looking likely for the 1650 Ultra as well when we discovered a lot of the 2060 KO performance discrepancies from the original 2060 and spoke to NVIDIA about it. One of the things that NVIDIA told us was, uh, oops, we didn't mean to do that. We'll probably make sure that doesn't happen again. So it's unlikely that that'll happen again. And it's unlikely a 1650 Ultra will be some magical GPU like the 2060 KO was. Uh, but nonetheless, the 1650 Ultra seems to retain most of the specs from the previously refreshed GDDR6 models. That would be the uh, exception, again, of a different cut of silicon. The silicon would be a TU-106 die, but dash 125 for the designator, the subname. This is a derivative of the same GPU in the original or the vanilla RTX 2060, which we can show some teardown footage from our original 2060 teardown. It was absolutely the worst video card that we've ever taken apart in terms of assembly quality. But it's in there. So it's a derivative of that. The RTX 2070 would count as well as with the RTX 2060 Super. They all use similar stuff. So other specs are mostly consistent with other refreshed GTX 1650 cards. This would be 896 uh, CUDA cores, as NVIDIA calls them, 4 gigabytes of G6, 12 gigabit per second GDDR6 frequency, 1590 megahertz boost clock, etc. Our best guess here is that NVIDIA is recycling TU-106 dies that weren't quite good enough for higher performing SKUs while also cleaning house ahead of the already known new generation of GPUs coming out. NVIDIA is likely disabling all of the RT and Tensor cores, paring down and repackaging as TU-106-125. This also allows NVIDIA to extract the most profit per wafer for its Turing chips with less waste, as not all of them are going to bin the same. Chips around the perimeter of the wafer, as an example, are typically regarded as lower quality. Next up, Nintendo offers a hollow apology for Joy-Con drift. It seems between starting new lawsuits, Nintendo just hasn't found the time to fix the utterly pervasive Joy-Con drift issue plaguing its hardware, despite a class action lawsuit that's currently playing out. The company has finally issued a rather hollow apology, for whatever that's worth. The apology comes from Nintendo president Shintaro Furukawa, who simply apologized for the inconvenience. Although due to the current class action lawsuit, Furukawa noted that he was unable to comment on the specifics. As a reminder, a class action lawsuit was slapped against Nintendo for Joy-Con drift issues last July. A few months later, the class action was amended to include the then-new Switch Lite, which immediately showed signs of drift upon launch. 
As of now, the class action lawsuit has supposedly headed towards arbitration. Back in 2017, we actually tore down the Switch and its Joy-Con controllers. And we tore down the Switch Lite more recently. Our news writer for uh, all these episodes, Eric Hamilton, has actually fixed a number of switches on his own and informs me that it's not too difficult. So if you do end up with this issue yourself, you could look into a solution. I believe iFixit has a guide on that for specifically Switch uh, Joy-Con uh, drift issues. Next up, data caps and uh, more data caps. So as of June 30th, the Keep Americans Connected pledge created by the FCC officially expired. What this means to most people is that ISPs will begin trotting out their arbitrary data caps once again and probably eagerly so. The Keep Americans Connected pledge was the FCC's response to the human malware situation in regards to internet and telephone connectivity, which saw a large swath of the country staying at home. As a result, those people were working, learning, and consuming more entertainment from home. The Keep Americans Connected pledge asked ISPs, but did not force, uh, that they pledge not to disconnect services and that they relax their data usage limits. Most ISPs took part of this pledge and agreed to remove data caps temporarily and vowed to not disconnect customers for their inability to pay. Some ISPs adhered to this pledge better than others. Verizon has been one that hasn't really stuck to it. So far, the FCC hasn't announced any intentions to extend this pledge, although it's not binding, uh, despite these surging human malware situation, at least in the US. Additionally, many ISPs have not indicated that they will extend the benefits provided under the pledge, whatever those may be, meaning that many will now start charging for data overage once again. If you're not in the US or not somewhere where you're familiar with how data caps work in some states, especially in the US, you'll have ISPs which are largely monopolized here or duopolies if you're in a, a good situation. Uh, they will impose a, an amount of data typically per month, at which point you have to pay for overage, kind of like cell phones would do. So that's what, this was supposed to remove some of that because the excessive data use obviously encountered at home where people are now suddenly doing everything they used to do in an office at their house or doing everything they used to do at school in their house. So the ISPs for the most part haven't indicated any desire to extend their pledge on this, uh, meaning that again, they're gonna start charging for data overage and attempting to collect payment on any outstanding balances. PC World noted uh, that some ISPs like Cox Communications, which lately has been our favorite one to discuss in the last few news episodes, have already returned with data caps. Uh, AT&T is promising to waive over its charges for customers with certain plans like AT&T Fiber, which if you have that, then they're gouging you to begin with. Well, at least if you're a business, speaking from experience. Uh, PC World has also curated a great list of most major ISPs and their current stance on data caps, overage fees, things like that. And we're happy to point you towards PC World. Uh, Gordon is one of the editors over there and we have a lot of fun doing videos with him every year. So, uh, although not, not so far this year since CES, but check them out. We'll link them in the show notes below as well. Finally, T-Force and the Ceramic C440 SSD. Uh, team has outed a new PCIe Gen 4 NVMe based SSD with an interesting bit of marketing. And you all know how much we love marketing here at Cameras Nexus. Uh, the T-Force Cardan... How do you even say that? Had to pause and do a cut because I'm not really clear on how to say the product name. The T-Force, we're gonna go with Cardea. A ceramic C440 SSD gets its namesake, at least in part, from a ceramic heat spreader that's on it. Ceramics for heat dissipation really aren't new. It's a common conductor. Uh, you can get ceramic heat sinks. It's also a common ingredient in a lot of thermal pastes. But anyway, they're using that uh, in the SSD as a heat sink. It's popular for Raspberry Pis, things like that too. And T-Force seems to be touting the SSD as the first to deploy a ceramic heat spreader for the NAND modules, which is the last thing that needs to be cooled. But anyway, the quote was, the use of aerospace ceramic composite cooling materials not only provides excellent heat dissipation, but also reduces heat by 18% uh, when the case is equipped with a fan, says team in its press release. So there, there's some more of that really great marketing math that we love to see with the percentages again, but uh, also aerospace. I mean, at that point, you're talking keyboards too, where Corsair used to do the whole aircraft grade aluminum thing that they did for keyboards, where basically almost literally any aluminum is aircraft grade because aircraft is all kinds of aluminum in them. Uh, and most of it, uh, bikes are made out of aircraft grade aluminum at that point too. And so is just about 
actually the cases we work with here are aircraft grade aluminum. Probably some aluminum cans are aircraft grade aluminum. So anyway, uh, this is kind of up there with that in terms of marketing quality. But as for the more realistic specs that actually matter, the ceramic SSD, the C440, is a PCIe Gen 4x4 one terabyte drive. It uh, is of the M.2 variety, so we're assuming that's a 2280 form factor but team has not specified the exact form factor as of this time. It also uses the NVMe 1.3 protocol, and further, while it's PCIe Gen 4, it is obviously, uh, it should be backwards compatible with Gen 3 too. It's just gonna be slower speeds for the maximum throughput. As for speeds, team is advertising sequential read and write speeds of about 5,000 megabytes per second and 4,400 megabytes per second, respectively. As for IOPS, team also claims read and write speed of 750,000 IOPS for each of those. So these speeds are all for the one terabyte model. The speeds with SSDs will change a bit depending on the capacity of those drives. They also have a two terabyte model. Uh, for durability, for endurance, the C440 has an MTBF rating of 1.7 million hours and a total bytes written rating of 1,800 terabytes for the one terabyte model. T-Force did not disclose pricing or availability at the time, or team didn't uh, at the time that we wrote this news story. So that's it for this one. As always, thank you for watching. If you'd like to pick up the X570 chipset Metro poster while you can, you can go to store.gamersaccess.net and grab that. Extremely popular, so thank you to all of you who bought the first round. It's back in now. And again, a, a shout out to everyone who tweeted at Gamers Nexus with their photos of the poster setup. We love seeing that stuff whenever you pick up our stuff. And if I see it, I try to retweet it as well. So thanks for sending those in, lots of fun. Uh, otherwise, you can go to patreon.com slash Gamers Nexus to get access to the newest extras videos like the new Patrons Ask GN. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time. might be called. Uh, news about...